Yo, yo, yo. What's good, my people? YouTube. Facebook. How y'all been? Please like and subscribe, like and share the video. What's good? What's good? Hey, what's good? Hope everyone is well. Michelina, como tamo? Christina, what's good with you? What's good with everybody on YouTube? How be? What's good? The phone box. What's up, brother? Gizzy man, Brian Taylor. Everybody, how y'all doing? Hope everybody's doing well. Let me give a call back to my partner right now and do this quick educational podcast for you guys. Hello. Hey, John. Hey. Yeah, let me see if uh, this person uh, sent you email. No, 321 area code. Is that uh, Florida? 321 area code is Florida, yeah. But yeah. That's not, that wasn't the... That wasn't the client I was talking about. No, it was William Torres. But anyways, anyways, yeah, I guys. Sent him, I sent him a, I sent him a call. Okay, all right, cool. Because he sent me, he has sent me a text before. Yeah, um, I got back to okay. today. All right, cool. So my people, we're live on YouTube. We're live on uh, Facebook. Uh, call Carmelo right now. Get this uh, going real quick. I need to know if you guys hear our quality good. If you guys um, hear it. Uh, please let me know. Let me call um, Carmelo now. Cafecito time. Mm. Please let me know if you guys hear the conversation loud and clear on Facebook and on YouTube. What's up, Carmelo? What's going on, man? Good, good. Thank you so much for uh, being on the call tonight. We got about 25 people uh, right now, both on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, do these podcasts just to educate people and let them know what's going on uh, in the credit repair in, in this, not in, in the credit, what's happening with credit so that they can have an understanding of how it works. And also our customers have been kind enough to uh, get on the phone, talk about their experience with us. And if anything, give us a testimonial. I have John on the other line. John, say what's up. Hey, Carmel, how you doing? Good, John. What's going on, man? Not much. Good, good. So John's going to ask um, Carmelo, who has been a customer for a while now. Uh, Carmelo, I met through uh, Facebook. And Carmelo watched my videos for a long time. He'll get into it. Uh, with, with John, see how he started. And if you guys have any questions, um, Carmelo is a real estate investor active. He, his um, hashtag is rent. What is the hashtag? Rent? Uh, rent money, yeah. R N T M N Y. Yeah. R N T M N Y, rent money, hashtag, because he does a lot of, um, what do you call those, the inner city? Rentals. We do a lot of low income housing. Low income housing, okay? Yeah. Uh, also, John is an avid real estate investor, too. Uh, today's podcast is going to be more on how, when you get good credit, what to do, because we have two real estate investors here that are going to educate you on that. So without further ado, John, go ahead. Carmel, you're a, you're a broker too, right? Are you an agent? Yeah, I'm a licensed uh, real estate broker, a licensed contractor, and I'm also licensed for the waste management company in New Jersey. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. I thought you, you guys hear them well? Two, Let me so know. Quality and sound the is the best. Was, what, maybe two years ago, I think? When yeah, it was about two years ago. I saw uh, his videos online. I was like, all right, let me inquire about this. I was using another company. Um, it was a law firm out of Texas. I think it was. It's a popular one. Um, I forgot the name of it now. And they were they really weren't doing much. And I was like, all right, I need to have it for the past style, 20 years of my life. My credit scores never went over 635, no matter how much real estate or credit debt I had. It was always 635, 640, and never peaked over 650 my entire life of having credit. So I was like, all right, I need to get this fixed, uh, you know, as soon as possible. So I was like, yeah, something wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's everybody goes to the same learning curve. And I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that ends up being confused is that people assume the more credit you take on, the more it's going to boost your score up, right? And yeah. the reality is, after a period of time, you realize that it's, it's the active scoring, the fluctuation, the score on a daily basis, assuming there's no negatives on there, is more your unsecured credit ratios and where you keep them, right? Uh, the more yeah. you max the cars out, the more it dumps your score out, at least 30, 40 points. But I guess it, the first time you worked with us, I think it was, um, you know, uh, I, I feel like we got the file done fairly quickly. Wasn't it about three or four months, somewhere in that region, I think? Yeah, it was uh, I think like three or four months ago. You guys reviewed what was on my credit and what I was doing wrong because, you know, I had a lot of, I would, you know, close out my credit cards thinking it was a good idea, and it wasn't. Um, you know, I would use my credit cards, you know, for buying and flipping real estate. So I'd max out my Amex, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, $20,000, and then I'd pay it back. But I was paying it at the wrong time because every time I reported to my credit bureau, it was a wrong time period. So then you guys showed me how to do that also, and it worked out really well. Um, yeah. So I, I learned a lot from you guys, and actually the score went up pretty quick. Uh, yeah. When nobody told me. Yeah, and it was and it was good. So then, you know, you've also been kind enough to send us over a lot of referrals, which we obviously greatly appreciate. I think the one thing that we, um, the one thing we try to impress with some of these, is, as far as testimonials are concerned, that people send over is, you know, if you could just, I mean, you know, obviously feel free to be brutally honest, but I mean, what are some pros and experiences with the service? You know, I, I know we have a history working together now um, with whether it be through people you send over yourself. So, I mean, if you could give anybody that hasn't started yet an understanding of exactly, you know, what your take on it is, I'd be appreciative of that. Uh, I'll tell you the truth. You guys are a lot easier. Than, uh, actually, the other one was called Lexington Law. Now it came back to me. Um, yeah. You guys are a lot easier than working with those guys. Uh, really, I, well, all I did was I kind of set up my uh, account online. I gave you guys the access. Um, I sent you a payment and that was it. <laughs> there wasn't much to it, to tell you the truth. Um, oh, I would get what, whatever reports I got, I sent over to you guys and then you took care of it at that point. So, uh, they were telling me to do this, this and this and you guys were pretty easy to work with. So, yeah. And I, and I think, and I think, um, you know, as far as I assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from when you started, so obviously as we, you know, to where you're at right now, I mean, obviously we're still, we still review your report periodically and it seems like you've done a good job of accumulating since think, you know, you've made the necessary adjustments to started working together. So I assume the credit markets started to be more favorable after the fact, right? Started getting better offers, better business. Yeah, I was getting uh, better business lines of credit because I would, you know, prior I would just get, you know, denied because my credit score was like low, you know, 635 and 640. And then when it went up to like the high sixes and low sevens, I know the business lines of credit would come in easier. Uh, my credit cards um, would, you know, boost up their lines also. So it made things a lot easier for the business side of things. Um, and actually then even when I did my refinances on some of my properties, um, I use a lot of banks that really don't look at credit. Uh, it's mostly collateralized. They're more worried about the collateral stuff with the rental properties, um, the ones that I do on my own. And um, actually those, you know, they actually, even though my credit score did go up a bit, they actually give me a little bit of favorable rate um, for the mortgages. So it actually saved me a, you know, a load of money there in itself. So, so we've done it long term, you know? Good, yeah. I mean, then obviously when it comes to real estate, obviously cash flow, great cash flow is a big thing, right? You get to make yeah, that exactly. and you put more money in your pocket. Um, so I think the one thing that we run into, kind of segueing into the real estate side of the the one thing that we run into a lot of people, and I know, I think I think Gizzy told me that you actually, you know, you mentor, you have a group you kind of mentor too, right? To get into buying buildings and things like that, right? So the one thing that we get a lot from people that come through and use the service and just general questions is that they, they like to go out and get credit cards um, to raise money for 
real estate, right? Yeah. And and you know, my recommendation almost regularly for that is just it's not a sustainable model, right? I mean, business lines of credit are, are completely different, right? With business yeah. lines of credit, you obviously have an amortization that's longer, it's more sustainable, it's revolving, you're not getting waxed on all the different variables. But we get a lot of people that come up with the dream that they want to literally purchase with credit cards, right? They want to get two hundred grand in credit card and they want to empty all of them out and go buy a house, right? And they forget yeah. the fact that the minimum payment on a credit card is two and a half percent. So you load up, you know, a hundred thousand dollars on a credit card, or you empty it out. You're, the minimum you're making is, you know, twenty five hundred. Whereas if you took out a thirty year loan, at, you know, four percent, that's four hundred dollars. You're getting waxed. Yeah, so exactly. I think I think that you know the one thing that the people listening, because everybody that gets affiliated with us to a certain degree, you know, have interest in real estate. So maybe you could just give us a little bit if you, you know, since you do help teach people. I know you bring some some investors up too, maybe some, some ideas on how you think, you know, the best way for them to get in and finance would be, you know, in the early stages, once the credit's ready. Yeah. I think in the early stages, you obviously everyone wants to use as much money as they have liquidity have available credit cards and lines of credit and whatnot. So I, I've seen it with a lot of investors they'll do, you know, they'll, 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 they'll max those things out as much as possible. But I, I think the most important thing is, and what I, you know, actually you guys taught me, um, because I do the same thing, you know, I'll use, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on an Amex a month sometimes. And then, you know, when my draw money comes in from the investors or my hard money guys or whatever, I just pay it right off. Right. And but hold on. I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but I just want to clarify. But you're yes. using that for the renovations, though, correct? And like renovations. Yeah. yeah. That's for renovations. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. I was describing people wanted to open up the cards to, to actually take possession of the property. You understand what I mean? Oh, uh, okay. So you're asking. You're using a hard money lender or a private money lender. They're taking the first position, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're purchasing outright for you and you're paying them a rate. You're using the cards for the for the renovations, which is completely exactly. logical, right? Makes yeah. complete exactly. sense. Yeah. Pay it off with the draws and so on. The problem we were having, and I'm going to interrupt you. I just want to clarify for anybody that's going to listen. The problem we were having and we still have, and we got to walk people back from is they want to buy outright with credit, right? It's 50, they want to buy house with a credit card? Correct. There you go. They want to they empty the credit card out and then they want to pay. And there's just such a disparity in the interest rates versus the amortization that it ends up, you know, being a problem. But keep going on what you were saying. So, you know, yeah. you pay back, et cetera. Go ahead. Yeah, you pay a lot. I guess I just tap on that and I'll get into that part. Um, because what I would do is like, I would max it out and then I would just pay it on the wrong date. So when you guys told me to find out from the credit card company when it hits to my credit report, it made a huge difference because I would pay it maybe you know, a few days before. So when it reports to my credit, it shows a zero balance. So my credit score went up dramatically. Uh, so that actually should that helped out a lot with you guys. But like, you know, touch based on what you're saying, you know, use credit cards to buy real estate. I don't know. I'm in Bergen County. Uh, there's not too many people that have five, six hundred thousand dollars on credit cards. Uh, but yeah, I, I can see it happening in, you know, South Jersey or Philly where houses are 10, 15, 20 thousand um, dollars. Is it a great idea? I don't think so. Um, but there is obviously alternatives of hard money, private yeah. money that's a lot cheaper than a credit card. Um, uh-huh. And then also, if you're maxing out your credit cards that buy real estate and you go to refinance, your DTI is going to be through the roof that you won't even get refinanced up and pay these credit cards back. Not only that, but taking it a step further, you have to pretty much do a cash out refi, which is hard to do, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not easy to do a cash out refi because you're not going to have a position against the property, right? So they're yeah. going to you're essentially going to have to take the cash out. They're going to lower the loan to value against it. And as a result, you're going to hurt yourself, right? So exactly. the, the whole point of it, which we constantly try and just impress upon them, is the fact that there's just no logic surrounding it. There's just a multitude. There's so much money in the system right now, right? Yeah. Um, that Especially on the private money side, the hard money side. I mean, it's become so competitive nowadays because people got to put money to work. Um, exactly. you know, there's a multitude of ways outside of that. But I think what you said is, is a very good point for anybody that's listening is that, you know, the proper way to do it is, is obviously to come in with some kind of a larger position, whether it be a private money lender or if possible to go to a retail bank or some kind of local credit union and, and get a construction to perm loan or somehow that's possible or renovation yeah. to perm and then use the cards for the renovation, you know, the actual costs of the materials, et cetera, and then pay yourself back to the draws. I think, yeah. I think that's the most sound way. And I think that's the most consistent way that everybody does it, right? I mean, yeah. I think 
from a perspective of just ease of flow and ease of process, I think it's probably just the easiest way to do it overall without really hitting any disruptions. And then, you know, if you do hit a snag where you pay a little bit more or something costs a little more, you still have the draws coming from the lender. So maybe you don't need to pay it all down into the card. You can float it a little longer, right? Because you have, you have the terms on the card. But um, so if you had, if you, again, a lot of the people, and I'm sure you experienced this, a lot of the questions we have people that are just trying to get started on the real estate side of things. Um, yeah, you know, they try to understand or, or ascertain where the best area to get started is. So to be, you know, where do you want to buy apartment buildings, right? That's the big thing. Everybody wants an apartment building, right? And, and, and you know, not all apartment buildings make money. A lot of them no. cap, like, a lot of them cap terribly, right? And, and then there's, exactly. And then there's a lot of, there's a lot of single family houses that cap incredibly, right? In certain parts yeah. of the country. I mean, exactly. you, can make as, you can make as much on a single family in some parts of the country as you could on a 10 family in another part of the country, right? Because the cap exactly. deviated in price. So if you could just touch on that a little bit, where you think the best, you know, the best angle for somebody just walking in would be, I think that would be yeah. good. Yeah, my, my, even when I started, you know, when I started investing, I went into like the low income areas. Uh, I started off in Jersey City and back then Jersey City where, you know, three families were $75,000. Uh, you know, I was buying six families for $125,000. So when, you know, you get these markets, you know, it's easy to make the entry points is very easy to get into. Um, obviously you just need to know how to manage these properties. Um, and then, and, and I tell even the investors today, you know, if you're looking, you know, through like, oh, New Jersey's priced out of the market, you can't find deals in New Jersey. But you know what, if you go down to Candom, you go down to Trenton, you go down to these areas, you can buy a house for 15, 20, $30,000 and rent it for twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 a month. Um, obviously you got to know your due diligence, do your markets, but then again, it, it varies from case to case scenario. You know, I can, again, I can go into Ohio, I can go into, uh, Michigan and other parts of the country and get, you know, better returns. Uh, so yeah, at, at the end of the day, it's just a matter of, you know, listen, picking your market you want to we'll learn about, learn that market inside out <clears throat> and then go invest in that market. You know, I've seen people like, you know, do New Jersey, then Pennsylvania, then Florida, then Ohio, then. I'm like, dude, you can't manage, you know, that's, that's impossible to manage. You're going to get so burnt out that you're going to end up walking away from everything eventually. Especially, yeah. especially if they're, if they're single families, right? I mean, you're yeah. running yourself crazy. Like, you know, it, no, absolutely. Yeah. Without a doubt, when you start spreading out the operation like that, I think the other thing that people forget and people don't realize is even if you buy it and, and, and you know, for lack of a better term, a dumpy area, like a lot of the stuff that I bought and, and I hold and that I've accumulated over a period of time is on Philly, right? I, I got in Philly before it took off at the Edgewood Hospital, Northern Liberties, Fishtown, so on and so forth, right? Um, back then, like you were saying, Jersey City, those areas of Philadelphia were, I mean, they were worth them, right? Yeah, but what people don't what people don't realize is there's a, the one the one great thing about real estate is it tracks inflation, right? It's the number one inflation kicker because obviously inflation measures how the cost of things increase over the course of time. So one of the things that's going to measure, you know, ex exponentially ahead of that, whether it be milk or lumber, et cetera, is going to be the product of the, the cost of real estate, the price of real estate. So it's always going to track ahead of inflation. As long as inflation is going in the right direction, you're going to see values go up. So even if you're buying a dumpy area, just by rule of thumb, they like to say 10% a year over a 10-year period. Now, it doesn't always work out like that. There's some areas that are stagnated, right? Yeah. Um, but for the most part, if you're near a major city and that city has, you know, millions and millions of people on it, those mm -hmm. gaps are going to fill. I mean, you were talking about Jersey City. I mean, forget about it now, right? I mean, the prices yeah, and crazy. stuff over there is, yeah, is ridiculous. Same in Philly, though. Philly's yeah. the same way. The prices have all come up. Now, there are still pockets in Philly that haven't finished yet, you know, yeah. but they'll fill, they'll fill in. This is exactly. like anything else. And I think if people go in, like you said, I think the, the due diligence factor is enormous, right? I mean, yeah. I think... And I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the biggest variables, because, you know, when it comes to real estate, um, finding the property, you know, even if even if somebody that's a new newer investor comes in and overpays a little bit, um, it's all right if it's in the right area and you got the cops to support it. Right. I think the big variable that people run into is finding the right contractor, right? And yeah. not get posed on the contractor. So maybe you could, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I know you guys do contracting, so maybe you can discuss that a little bit for anybody in the area. Yeah, we do contracting for investors. Like I, and I, I tell people all the time when I interview, when I meet with a contractor or a client, it's like, I'm, you're not going to hire me. I'm going to hire you as a client. Because if I don't want to work with you, I don't have to work with you. You know what I mean? So, and if you're going to be a pain in my ass, I'm not going to fucking deal with you. 
Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the biggest thing is, you know, as you, as you find a great deal, you found a decent deal, and now you have to manage the contract and you never managed the contract before. A lot of these newbie investors are at their mercy. They'll listen to everything this contract is going to tell them. Like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, fix this, fix that. And now they're getting hosed by this guy. And next thing you know, they dished out twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars and the guy did ten thousand dollars worth of work because his investor didn't know, hey, listen, you know, Dead Morgan House is four thousand dollars. You know, the demo house, but the, the contractor told me it's ten grand or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, it's very. I, I you know I tell my students all the time, you know, whenever you do deal with a contractor, you know, you gotta you really gotta be very specific on when you sign that contract. And the way I tell them, it's like, okay, this is you know a thousand dollars before you start this part of the project, a thousand dollars after you're done, a thousand dollars after before installation. A thousand dollars after installation, a thousand dollars before electrical, a thousand dollars before plumbing. So that way, you know, the work is being done and everyone's getting paid and it's moving along. But you know, I see some of these guys. I, I've met with clients, and the guy, like you know, oh, the guy with ninety percent of the job is paid and literally maybe sixty percent of the work is done. What's he gonna do? That contract is not gonna stick around. You're gone. Your money is gone. Everything is gone. Um, so, and then also you gotta keep in mind is that. You're paying hard money. You're paying, if you bought on a credit card, you're really getting fucked. Um, so, you know what? You've got the cheapest contract for thinking you saved yourself a fortune. This is going to be a great flip. Now you're going to find out seven more months were added on to that. The guy hosed you, and now you're going to pay somebody else. And now that deal went from a flop to a flip in a matter of minutes. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. No. And, and you know what the other thing, not to interrupt you, know what the other thing that ends up happening is the guys that come in. And they front load all the payments and don't, you know, they get all their money up front. And then yeah. you got to bring somebody in after you, they go back to the work and the work's trash, right? So then that stuff, because it's very difficult for these guys to work on top of each other's work. And most of them don't like to do it anyway. So, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that, that the reality is that, I mean, if there's, a, even if you got to pay a little more in the early going during the respect to the finding the right contractor that answers the phone and is trustworthy. I mean, it's yeah. shocking to me at this point in time in civilization that contracting as a whole, even on the commercial side, is still so hit or miss, right? Yeah. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's tough to find a crew. Yeah, It takes time to develop a crew that you can rely on, that's going to be there when they say they're going to be there. You know, even yeah. if you give them tons of jobs, they might be out the night before. I mean, there's a stigma that goes with with construction. And, and in some cases, in a good majority of it, you know, that stigma is not entirely inaccurate as far as, like, yeah. you know, showing up on the job, being reliable, being accountable, and you really have to do your diligence. I mean, I tell people all the time that I ask, I say, you know, the one area, because real estate, like I said before, is not, you know, if you can do comps, if you know how to comp properties, you know, and you can, and you can, and you're good at buying, you know, you're not somebody that likes to overpay for things. I mean, you can handle that part on your own over the course of yeah. time and through diligence, right? The yeah. area that it gets real hairy is the contracting side. If, if there's work that needs to be done, because that you can either have a, you can either turn that property into a gold mine or that thing can be, a, like you said before, a flop and a heartbeat. And that heartbeat is, and most people that are coming in, they watch these, you know, these, these, these TV shows, right? The ones that glorify the house flips and, you know, the guy mm -hmm. walks in and it looks like a, it looks like a toilet and the next screenshot, it looks like a mansion, right? I mean, they don't, exactly. they don't show any of the, the heavy lifting. They don't show any of the unexpected, you know, this and that, et cetera. So it ends up being, you know, it ends up being so misleading that the people that maybe aren't geared up for it get involved in it and they get a real smack in the face early on in the process. Yeah, um, exactly. So when you guys are, when you and your, you know, your group, whether it be your students or just in general, when you guys are coming out to target properties, whether it be on a renovation, um, a new construction, or just a, a, a fix and flip, what are you guys typically targeting as far as returns? Because I'm sure some people would love to hear that. So when you walk in and you do your numbers on, let's just say you were doing a flip, what are you looking at for like cash on cash return to make it? 10, 10 to 12% usually. You know what I mean? So if I'm buying, if I'm buying, I'm willing for a house for like $600,000, I got I to make at least $60,000 on that deal. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's why I like to, you know, so if I'm buying, if I'm flipping a house for three fifty, forty, dollars 400000 dollars I like to make at least minimum $40,000 on that flip. Um, so usually, you know, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get at least 10% on, you know, on a deal like that. Anything less than that, I really don't want to waste my time uh, because it's not worth the headache because you'll be, you know, I'm not going to sit there six months. You know, by the time I close, do the permits, do the blueprints, do the work, the carrying costs, the construction, and then hold it and close again, come in for six months, let's just say, you know, six months. 
Sure. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make fifteen grand. I can make that flipping burgers at Burger King. You know what I mean? I don't need to flip a house to make fifteen thousand dollars. You know, so yeah. It, it's, it's, it, it, in this market, so it's hard to find those kind of deals. But you know what? I just shifted my entire business to either construction and and make money that way. And you know? also, either way, it's yeah. money to be made in this business. So. No, 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 for sure. And I think the one thing again that the, the, this television revolution of every other show is a house flipping show has gotten has just completely inundated the, the residential market, right? And and a lot of the fix and flips. So what it's doing is maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, you know, there may have been ten offers on a property. There's fifteen now, right? So there's just a lot more squirrels that are trying to get the same nut, which is driving prices up. Where people like you and I that maybe would be picking, right? When you yeah. find particular properties and we have a number that it needs to be at, right? In order for us to even consider offering them, that number gets completely absorbed, right? And then somebody pays 10% over it. So you're sitting there doing the math. Yeah. And I'm speaking cumulatively here. You're doing the math. You're saying, if I can only do this in this place, how on earth is this guy who doesn't know what he's doing? Buying mm-hmm. it for 10% more, right? Yeah. And, and, and he's trying to stop What's that? This guy fucking from day one. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what I'm saying. And then you look, you know, just, just to humor myself, I track it after the fact, right? And then you see yeah. when they sell it, they sell it for 15% over market, right? Yeah. Just because they paid 15% over market when they bought it, right? Or whatever it was worth. So then you, you got this constant flow of chasing. So I think that, um, I do think that there's always going to be a market in real estate. And I think as long as, uh, you know, I think I think a crash in real estate is is something that, that we won't see again for a long time, just because of rates being low, and just because how how much easy money there is in the system. And as time goes on, that easy money yeah. is only to continue to um, you know grow, right? I mean, I can't even imagine it as far. I don't even have a monetary total monetary amount, but I can't even imagine how much money is completely geared towards just you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, real estate right now, real estate related funds geared towards just fix and flips and yeah. just overall private equity for bigger businesses, um, bigger properties and such. But that all being said, without going off on a tangent, um, you know, if you had advice for somebody that was just walking in and 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 really has no background but wants to get into business, what would your suggestion be as far as the type of project to get in first? What are you telling your What are you telling your students? I tell all my investors from day one. Every single one. If you're looking to get into this business, go by yourself for a three, four family house, FHA, put as minimal money but out of pocket, live there, rent it out, live there for free. You're going to learn how to manage tenants. You're going to learn how to manage repairs. You're going to learn how to you know, manage uh, the mortgage company and the, those loopholes and stuff, how to apply for mortgages. And then in the interim, you're going to be saving a shitload of money because you're not paying $1,200, $1,500 a month in rent and your cash flowing. Uh, probably a few dollars a month. And then when you learn that hands-on because you're living there and all that stuff, then you take that money that you saved in the six, 12 months and go buy yourself another property. You know what I mean? And then cash flow on that property. You know, so, you know, people don't realize with the FHA program, you, you know, if you have a decent job, I was a school teacher. I was making literally $945 every two weeks when I bought my first property, you know, and I bought a two family for $315,000. Uh, so if I can do it as a school teacher and that kind of salary, uh, anybody can do it if you, you're making it, you know, making some kind of money and got decent credit. And my credit back then is still six thirty five. <laughs> yeah, well, that, you know what it is. That's 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 one of the perks of FHA, right? FHA. And for anybody listening, the thing he's talking about is FHA will go up to a four family if it's a primary residence, right? So no, exactly. He he bought it as a primary residence. He lived in one of the units, rented out the other three, and you can absorb the the rental income from the other three. And, you know, with that, you still get the minimum threshold that FHA provides, which is 620. Um, you get all the flexibility that comes with it. So I think that's a great, you know, I think that's great advice because I think it obviously, without jumping in blindly, right, you get to work out some of the kinks, but you're living there in the meantime, right? So yeah. whatever, you know, somebody else is paying your rent in the meantime while you're working through the kinks. And at the very least, if there's any, if there's any learning curves that exist, right, I mean, you're kind yeah. of doing it while you're living there. So it's not something that's accumulating extra extra interest on the side or that you're having to come out of a savings to carry you're just operating to your typical um budget because obviously it's working to your budget at that point but i do think yeah yeah, i think that's a great idea um you know obviously not all areas are as good as you know and rent wise as jersey city or that particular area right but you're right there are a number of other areas around where you know people have that luxury and they'd have that ability 
um, to be able to get in and do that. And I think that I think that is a very good way. So what is your suggestion, though, then, if you're talking to your investors or your students or whatever, um, when getting into a renovation is a good idea? When do you think in their evolution that would be a good idea to get to that point? Well, right now, like I said, it's a seller's market. So if you get in good enough, you buy, you know, obviously you, you make money when you buy the deal. You're not making money during the construction process. You're not making money when you're flipping the house. You're making money when you buy the property at the right number mm-hmm. and you analyze that deal properly. Because if you don't do that, you lost money from day one. Um, so if you can get, you get the right house and the right numbers and you got a good crew to do the renovations and you're in and out in six months, you know, then you'll, you'll make money on the flip. Um, so yeah, that could be done anytime. It could be in a, you know, you're in a seller's market right now. So the, the inventory is low and the you know, prices keep going up and up and up. So it's a good time to get into buy and flip. I'm doing, I've been, I'm doing a few flips myself now. I'm not doing, I'm not doing too many buy and holds because obviously I can't find good numbers. Um, and even if I do have a buy and hold that I have actually on the contract, I might just sell it because by the time I finish renovating and selling it, a comp might be selling for almost a hundred thousand dollars more. Than I'm gonna, you know, that I anticipated. So I is, is it? Is it? I mean, it's appreciating that much in Bergen County right now. You getting? It's moving that much. I have one under contract when I bought it. When I it's been on the contract for a year because of oil tank uh, remediation. But the comp was about probably like six ninety nine ARV, and one went under contract eight ninety nine, and it's selling for eight fifty, and it's wow. identical house to the one I have. Um, so I'm like, all right, great. You know what I mean? It's been on the contract for a year already. So by the time I close on it, I, I almost made $150,000 more. Uh, so I'd rather just sell it and keep it as a rental property. Because by the time I collect, you know, $250,000, I'll be 150 years old, you know, at $2,000 a month. So, right. so it, it varies from case to case scenario, but I know also advise, you know, you know, first time flippers, if you can is, Flip, like when I started, I started, I started flipping multifamily houses. Um, I flipped, you know, two, three, four families in Jersey City. I must have flipped over a hundred doors, you know, back then. And trust me, I'm kicking myself in the ass. If I owned a hundred doors right now, I'd be driving a Bugatti. Uh, (laughs) uh, But, you know, with with flipping the multifamilies is safe because number one, if you flip it, you make money. And if you don't flip it, you can rent it out and you still lease make any cash flowing so it's yeah. a win-win situation no matter which way it happens yeah uh, i think, so that, and I think that's good because not to interrupt you but just elaborate but i no. think that's a good idea just because of the fact that if you do end up holding it and you keep it and you rent and you get the rent rate side there's people that just come and buy cash flow buy cap rates right they have they have capital they got to put the work you know nothing fixed income right now is yielding anything significant if you can show a six or seven cap to somebody i mean uh, yep. they, you know, I mean, that's a big number for somebody just that has cash and needs to put it to work and needs to get a return on it that it's secure, right? So, I mean, I think yep. that's great advice given the fact that, you know, it's kind of a win-win if they come in with one excuse and it doesn't pan out the way they need. They're kind of backdropped as long as they can get the finance. But keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I, 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 you know, if you're looking at it as a first-time flipper, I would try to maybe get into the multifamily flips because at least that way, if the shit hits the fan, at least you got yourself a rental property. You know, even if a contractor hoes you over, or that your carrying costs were a lot more than you anticipated, at least you can, you can be absorbed into that deal. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, not a huge life of it. Yeah. yeah, you're not, you know, you're, 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 you're not falling bankruptcy after your first deal or your wife is divorcing you. you know? right. Right. Yeah, that's good though. So, I mean, do you guys, do you guys also offer financing to your clients? Like, like I, I assume you guys provide you some kind of liaison between the lenders you use and your investors and your students. So just so everybody that's listening to you knows everything you offer, do you guys, do you guys offer private money options for people that come through? Yeah, for our investors and our students, you know, we, with our local and whatnot, we can, you know, we have some funds available. If I'm not flipping any deals, I've got money sitting around, <laughs> you know, we'll fund some of their deals if the numbers are really good. Or we just broker it out to like a hard money broker or whatever the case may be. So there's, there's, there's obviously that we have things lined up for them, uh, thing being so definitely okay. them out that way. So just to elaborate, just again, because everybody's got a different working now, like I was explaining earlier. When we were talking earlier about private money, hard money, just so everybody that's listening understands, right? It's kind of the idea behind private money is essentially that, you know, there's, there's organizations or individuals that have capital they want to put to work and they don't, right now, current lending market is like 3% on a residential mortgage, like three and a half, maybe three and quarters. I mean, that's not a yield that most people want right now. And the people that are more aggressive 
will be willing to lend it privately. So in most cases, they're going to lend against an asset that can be collateral based lenders, right? So they're going to go, they're going to ask normally. I mean, I don't know, Carmelo, about yours, but most yeah. of them want anywhere from 10 to 20% down on the purchase of whatever it is. And then they'll work into an ARV, the ARV meaning after repair value, the work often after repair number. So if you're buying a house for 100000 they might ask for 10 or 20% down. Let's call it 10. You're borrowing 90. And you say yeah. there's $50,000 in renovation, you're into it for 140 total, right? And yeah. after the fact, the ARV is what it's supposed to be worth after you do the renovation. So let's say it's worth 300 after you do the renovations and you owe 140, you're technically levered, meaning you owe against what it's worth about 45%. So that's what the ARV is. That's the after repair value. And yeah. that's, the, that's the ratio that they're using in determining what they're willing to lend. Most third money lenders deviate. I mean, normally it's just, what, around 70, 75, Carmelo? I mean, uh, seven, at all market, we're 65. 65, all right. I think they deviate a little bit in yeah, different I mean, markets. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, you guys are on the high end, so there's a lot more exposure there as far as Bergen yeah. County. So um, it's probably why it's down back a, a, a hair. But most of the time, there'll be some, let's call it 70 in the middle, they'll lend up to 70% of that ARV. Uh, yeah. that after repair value in a way and kind of diagnosing deals for people that want to come in. And the thing is that that private money, because they're willing to do it not entirely credit based, they're going to do it on the asset and the individual. Um, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to, because they're not taking documentation, they're going to, they're going to up the rate a little bit. So rather than you paying three and a half, four percent, Carmel, I don't know what you guys pay over there, but I know, you know, in Philly and some of the surrounding areas and down here in Florida, um, it ranges anywhere from, you know, I've seen good situations where it's as low as nine, I've seen bad situations where it's as high as 12, but I feel like 10 is about the sweet spot. I mean, are you, what are you seeing over in, in, in North Jersey? We're getting, uh, to, uh, with, we're getting a 7.5 for our hard money and two points. Um, so that's not too bad. No, that's, I mean, look, if you consider the fact that, you know, the stated income programs that are out there right now, and they are out there, the no-doc and, and the unconventional type loans that are out there, I mean, they're quoting like 6.5%, so you're only paying 150 basis points higher than that for, for hard money. I mean, that's, that's actually really good. Um, yeah. So, I mean, even the two points is nominal, right? I mean, at, at the end of the day, I mean, you're exactly for somebody that's paying more than that, which most are, I, I think that two points gets eaten up real quick as far as not really being a, um, a problem with the deal. So um, I guess, again, another thing that, that we can kind of dive into real quick is is um, your rental. So in your experience with renting for anybody that is interested in potentially renting property, um, what is what would you give advice as far as, People that are, are bent on getting into cash flow, just building up cash flow, getting out of their current, you know, work situation, right? Just slowly building up cash flow to get to replace that income and get out. So all they're concerned about is just coming in and buying cash flow through these rentals. They don't have any experience with tenants. What is your suggestion as far as trying to identify the best tenant? Um, yeah. Um, you know, that they can tolerate. Yeah, what it boils down to is just screening, you know, screening the tenants the proper way. You know, I've been doing this for, you know, almost 16, 17 years. So I kind of, you know, uh, mastered, you know, screening tenants. So, you know, we do a background check. We verify the income. Even if they give us pay stubs, we do a uh, employment verification letter. Um, we did W-2s, you know, the standard stuff that we ask for from tenants. And usually, you know, if you screen them properly, you're not going to have any issues whatsoever. Um, but again, you know, I've taken over buildings you know, from previous landlords had no clue what they're doing. They're not the screen the tenants. And now I'm taking over the building with problems, like huge problems. So now I got to, you know, and then I got to either work them over and turn them into good tenants or just evict them and, you know, call it a day and part ways. Um, so I just think screening is the, you know, most important thing with, you know, spend the extra few dollars, screen them properly, the extra few minutes or whatever, and do it the proper way. And if it's done properly, then you have no problems whatsoever. You know, we give our students a checklist of what needs to be done. And if they follow that checklist, seldomly you're going to have a problem. I have over three, you know, well, now we're just under 300 doors because we sold a few buildings. Uh, but we have one vacancy as of right now. You know what I mean? Uh, so. And then another thing that, you know, I always tell the students is that, you know, you're in the hospitality business. I don't care if you're in you know, a class A neighborhood. Or you're in a class D neighborhood like I am in Newark in those markets, you're still in the hospital. These are people you're dealing with. I don't care 
where they're from. So if you treat them really with respect, they're going to respect you right back. It's the, you know, it's not like a, you know you, you can't treat people like garbage. No. Uh, but I have tenants that been with me you know literally sixteen years, and I got tenants that left and came back. You know um, they, they don't even want to leave. Uh, but like I said, you know, I teach uh, everyone gets treated with respect. I never call them by their first name. They're always Mr. and Mrs., Mr. and Mrs., Mr. and Mrs. That shows a sign of respect. Um, so if you do stuff like that, it makes a huge difference on how people are going to treat you as a landlord, you know, and treat your prospect at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 for sure. I mean, I think the respect thing, right, is huge. Yeah. I think that's in any walk of life, right? I mean, I think yeah. any walk of life is. You know, you treat people, with, uh, you know, with respect, you're going to get that same level of respect back because you're not yeah. breaching that line, right? And and there's a certain level of integrity there. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think, uh, and I think the one thing for anybody getting in, I mean, I, I think it's tough to assume somebody else's tenants, right? Like if you're walking yeah. into somebody, it's very, very difficult for the reasons you described. But if you do get in a situation where you got to evict the tenant, I mean, I know in Philly, it's like 30 or 60 days, right? You can get them yeah. out. Um, I don't know, but I know every municipality is different and, and it's not a fun process, right? I mean, so if you can avoid it, um, you know, yeah. obviously, obviously that's something you want to, that's something you want to do. Or if you're, if you're concerned for anybody listening and buying a property that has tenant, you should vet it with the seller, you know, and get an idea of that, how they vetted that particular tenant. Yeah. Um, because then you can see if that tenant's up the code, or if you want them out, you know, it, it, the seller can have to buy them out of the lease and get them out of the house before you can. I mean, yeah. I think the potential cash flow of the project is what actually exists. If you can assume it, that's great, but don't put yourself in a position where you can shoot yourself in the foot either, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, Dizzy, you still there? Yeah, I'm over here. Uh, got some questions from uh, YouTube, and also a question. I know that. Um, Carmelo posted today on Facebook that property taxes were high in uh, in Bergen County in in, uh, in a town. Do you take that into consideration when you purchase a home, whether you're going to flip it or do any type of renovations? Oh me, yeah, I do take that into consideration because at the end of the day, um, that's going to play into part and who, who's who's going to be able to qualify for that mortgage. So the higher the property taxes the smaller the buyer pool that's making $300,000 a year to qualify for that mortgage. So if I'm buying, you know, a property for $350,000, I'm going to put 150 grand into, it. I'm going to sell it for 600,000 and the property taxes are $24,000. That's a very limited buyer pool. Who's going to be able to qualify for that property, you know, where I can find a house for 600,000 and taxes are $12,000, a different story, you know? So it does right, play a big factor. Right. So, Gizzy, understand what you're saying. Though. He's talking about in regards to how it breaks down. So if it was a rental that you have to you have to escrow for your taxes. So if it's a twenty four thousand dollar property, it's two grand a month. They're going to add onto the payment. It would chew up your cash flow on a rental or a lot of it. Right. It would chew up almost yeah. two grand. That same property in Philadelphia, the taxes are like four grand in Jersey. They're twenty four thousand. Right. Yeah. So from a from a rental um, perspective, it, it, the higher taxes completely obliterates your cash flow, right? And your cap rate. But over and above that, what he's saying is that, and I'm just clarifying, I know you said it clear, Carmel, I'm just trying to put it in layman's terms. He, he you know, when uh, when you're when you're selling a property, you also have to fact that in just the payment, which will affect somebody's debt to income, right? So it's going to end up if, if you if you borrow six hundred thousand on a mortgage, the principal and interest payment at three and a half percent is about nineteen nineteen hundred twenty one hundred somewhere around there. Now, if you add in a place that has twenty four thousand in taxes, that's an extra two Gs, so that nineteen hundred dollar payment goes to thirty nine hundred dollars. If it's the same area where it's twelve thousand, you only know, it's it's a thousand dollars cheaper. Meaning, if someone's tight, which most people are when they're borrowing on their debt to income. It, it tightens your buyer base because they're going to have to make more money in order to qualify for it, stay within the, you know, 45, 50, 55% debt to income ratios. So yeah. maybe that just provide a little more clarity. That's all. Or maybe confuse the worst. Who knows? Yeah, that's what I meant. I think that's what I thought I said. <laughs> yeah, it is what you said. I was just trying, for everybody that doesn't understand it, I was trying to provide a little more detail. Yeah, but can't you, um, can't you uh, file taxes and write that as a loss or can you tax remediation or something like that? Isn't New Jersey like you get back $10,000 if you pay over 10000 in taxes? No, now with the new law, you're only allowed to write off up to $10,000 of your property taxes. So if I have the property taxes of $20,000 on my, you know, primary residence, I can only write off $10,000 of that as an expense. I can't write off the entire amount. So it's actually worse. 
than it yeah, was last year. Yeah, it's it, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Well, in New Jersey, yeah. I mean, you see, you see, like, yeah, like, you know, a lot of others too, like Greenwich, Stanford, some of the, some of the high priced areas, right? They just get robbed from it. So, um, but yeah, it's, it, it ends to taxes. There's nothing good about higher taxes. But go ahead, because I think you said you had some questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm disabled veteran. I don't quite want to use my VA, but I would like to invest in multifamily for my first investment. I, uh, and I myself am a retired contractor, but he wants to know. Uh, hey, Gizzy, can we purchase with a business or LLC? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you, you can buy properties in the business. There's banks and the, uh, companies out there, and they're strictly based off of uh, the performing the performance of that property. Your rates are going to be much higher. You're probably looking at maybe 6.9% compared to, you know, maybe 4.5%. Um, but they only care about the rental of that property. So if that property is producing enough cash flow to pay the mortgage and all the debt, they'll give you the loan on that property. Yeah, it's definitely doable. <clears throat> yeah, and sometimes and sometimes in whatever if it's in the city, in the local area that's kind of the, the, the high density, there's some local credit unions that'll that'll invest back in to that area for people that are doing what Carmel is describing. So yeah. sometimes they'll have programs in the name of businesses because the whole perspective behind the, the, the credit union that was developed in that neighborhood was to grow the neighborhood, right? Well, this is how you're doing yeah. it. You're lending to businesses that are fixed up and grow the neighborhood. So if you have one of those opportunities, you could definitely go to one of those local credit unions or, or things like that. And, and normally they have a program to help facilitate that as well. Yeah. Okay. Also, I have someone here asking, Brian. <clears throat> How do you rent property to Section 8 tenants? Um, really, you, yeah, anybody can. Legally, you can't discriminate. Um, so what happens is when we advertise our properties, we just advertise Section 8 okay in our, in, our, um, in our advertisements. And that's pretty much it. And then what happens at that point is a process. So, for example, a tenant comes to your property, they like the property, then they hand you what's called a voucher application. And you have to execute all the paperwork and provide the checklist of items that they need from uh, you as a landlord, the owner. Then you take that paperwork to their caseworker. Uh, and what I do is I either e email it in or fax it in and then mail in a hard copy also. So I do three ways. I fax it, email it, and mail a hard copy to their caseworker. And then they process the paperwork. Uh, once that's processed, they send an inspector out to verify that the apartment's in habitable condition. Uh, it meets the Section 8 guidelines. Once it's approved, they issue what's called a HAP contract. That's the contract between the landlord, the tenant, and the housing authority. And that basically states, okay, the tenant can move in on this date, and the rent is going to be this amount. This is what Section 8 pays. This is the tenant's portion of the rent, and now they're allowed to move in. So then at that point is once that's executed, uh, we get we collect the security deposit from the tenant and their portion of the first month's rent and we hand them the keys and they move in and then we just uh, move forward from there. Yeah. Does this work in every uh, county the same way? Um, it's a government, it's a federal government program. So, yeah, it works pretty much across the country that way. OK. And different areas, of course, they have different prices, right? Of course, yeah. Every time, every and so there's basically you have, um, you have your what's called your city housing, which is like your Newark Housing Authority, Cincinnati Housing Authority. Then you have your county, which is like your county, have like Essex County Housing Authority, Orange County Housing Authority, and then you have the DCA, which is the state. That's the Department of Community Affairs. Every state has their own Department of Community Affairs. Um, so there's three different programs of Section Eight. So it just varies from case to case scenario on where you're located and what's available. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, I got some other question here. Uh, uh, Sam is asking, would it be difficult for a new investor to go to a state like Florida with 10,000 cash to be able to get funding for investment in properties in the 20 or $50,000 range while technically being unemployed? I can, I can, I can do this. I, I the, the, uh, I, I mean, it, look, having ten thousand dollars liquidity is good. Targeting a fifty, forty, fifty thousand dollar area. I mean, I think every state has them. I mean, the question is, 
is is whether that forty or fifty thousand dollar area has any life to it. You know, these areas gentrify by what's going on around them and what people are coming in to allow it to gentrify businesses, et cetera, like that. Normally, you know, I know in, in urban areas it's centered around a lot of big developments that come in, whether it be corporate or housing, et cetera. Um, when you get in South Florida or at least Florida in general, it's very spotty. The, the, the coasts of Florida are developed. When you get into the center of Florida, it's it's very very touch and go. I mean, a lot of it is farmland. And it's undeveloped. So, you know, is it possible to find something for 50 grand and have 10 grand? Sure, it's possible. But the question is, you don't want it to be dead money. If that 10K is your last 10K and you're pumping into an area that's not going to appreciate. See, me and Carmelo are talking about areas like Philly, like Jersey, these areas of Jersey. They're appreciating areas. They're very, very dense. There's a lot of people coming in every single day. It's, a, you know, obviously North Jersey surrounded by a very populated city. That's constantly driving people that don't want to live in the city out there. As long as you have that flow, it works. It's very possible there are areas of this country where, where real estate can depreciate because there's absolutely nothing going on there. They don't appreciate and things only can move in one or two directions. You can see in some very, very rural areas, um, the land more, you know, costs more money than the actual houses, you know. So it ends up being a situation that, I mean, the answer, yes, you could, you could do that. But if you had 10 K to put down, you could probably leverage it a little further out and raise the price point a little and be in an area that's a little more um, investor friendly so that you wouldn't be putting yourself in such a tight box of maybe where, you know, your investment horizon could be a little bit tighter. Okay. Yeah. Another question is, Giz, what's your take on utilizing, say, a decent single family home for an Air Airbnb rental? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. What's your take on utilizing, say, a decent single family home for an Airbnb rental? I, I, I haven't done too many Airbnbs, but I know people that have, and they've done really well with them. Um, number one, you have to find out if that specific lo lo town or location will allow you to do Airbnb. Uh, some towns don't allow you. It's uh, against their uh, you know zoning or um, ordinances in town so you got to double check with that first uh number two um i believe there is an air if you go on airbnb or on the if i believe you become like an airb affiliate you can check on the back end uh it'll give you an estimate if you put in the address and whatnot on how much money you can generate in that area based on demand um, I've never done it before. I know people that own have done Airbnbs and they've done it. So they can, it'll tell you, okay, this property will generate $4,000 a month in income gross. Uh, if you do Airbnb, uh, at this price or whatever the case may be, but then you got to keep in mind, you have expenses. You got to pay the utilities. You got to pay the internet. You got to pay for the cleaning, um, all that stuff also. So maybe the $4,000 might not be the best route to go. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen people do Airbnb. I've seen people that own like, you know, three family houses in Newark and they'll rent one apartment Airbnb and that one apartment will make three, four thousand dollars a month in itself. Wow. Um, so there's definitely ways to make money with Airbnb for sure. And there's people that make Airbnb money without even owning any real estate. They just, yeah. Yeah. you know, they'll they'll rent an apartment in, in, a, in a high desirable area um, and they know how to do Airbnb and they'll just sublease it out, you know, but you want to make sure in your lease. Uh, you know, the school's not going to landlord. Someone tried that <laughs> doing that with me in Newark, and when they got caught, I kicked them out. Oh, wow. Uh, but if it was, was honest with me from day one, I'd been like, all right, let's, you know, let's work something out. You know what I mean? So, so you well, think yeah. they'll be better if it's going to be around properties that are in um, touristy areas? Yeah, it definitely got to be in touristy areas. You know what I mean? You can't be like in the middle of Hurricane Valley. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure you have to be, obviously be like, you know, close to New York, close to an airport, you know, close to some downtowns and stuff like that, you know, ball fields, um, stuff like that for the most part, I guess. Yeah. Should you go like, let's say around where the hotels are at and take the hotel business? Mm -hmm. Well, it varies because like in Miami, Miami is like probably 90% hotels anyway. Uh, and they pass laws down in Miami. You can't do Airbnb. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Well, maybe the next town over will allow it. So you got to, you got to, like anything else, you got to analyze the deal, do your due diligence, and see what's doable. You know? Yeah, like something that's right off the highway to a major city. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So uh, section eight uh, in your.
Also, okay. Section 8, your property will definitely have to be Section 8 approved, and they are strict about that, at least in the state of Missouri. This is uh, someone who answered, who asked the question. Yeah, yeah, they are strict. Um, the great thing about Section 8 is if you actually read the HAP contract, it benefits a tenant and it benefits the landlord. Um, you can't be a slumlord if you want to rent Section 8 tenants. you got to maintain the buildings. So it keeps the tenant, you know, it keeps your property value up because you need to maintain those properties <clears throat> if you want to get paid. Also, if you read the half contract, the tenants can't deal drugs. They can't, you know, cause a disturbance. They have to pay their portion of the rent. If not, if they breach that contract, then they can lose their voucher. And if they lose their voucher, that's like handing in a winning lottery ticket. You know what I mean? So... You can use that to your advantage when you, the tenants are giving you a hard time. They're like, well, you know what? If you read the half contract, page seven, paragraph number 10, it says here, you have to pay your portion of the rent. You owe me $200 every single month. So why are you behind? And then what I do is I highlight that. I send it with a cease and desist letter. I CC their caseworker. And 99.9% .9 of the time, I never have a late payment again. You know? So... You can use that to your advantage as a Section 8 landlord. You just got to know what you're doing. Okay. Most Section 8 landlords never even read the half contract. Okay. With all the properties that you've had, have you ever used a realtor to rent your property? As you know, New York City passed the law that, you know, really realtors can't get like a commission from the renter whenever they go and rent a property. They'll get mm -hmm. that commission from the, the, the owner of the house itself. Hold on, let me just let me just say this real quick. That just for the record, what New York was doing is unorthodox to begin with, right? That's unusual that they would take, you know, a year's worth of, of rent and then charge a fifteen percent surplus on top, and that would be the agent's commission. In normal parts of the world, you know, in the rest of civilization probably, when you when you when a, an agent meant something for you it's based on the security deposit or whatever you get down and that's how they get compensated whatever the money that they get down they get a portion of that and then the, the whoever's renting it has to cover the difference in they're coming out of pocket it's completely unusual the dynamic that new york had but new york had it because these, the agents in new york city were pigs so they needed to figure out ways to build in more and the people could afford it so i mean correct me if i'm wrong uh, Carmelo, but I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything other in New York City where they take a twelve an annual rent for you, so you're paying two grand a month. That's twenty four thousand dollars a year, and then they get a commission on the total gross rent for the year. That seems insane to me. Yeah, that, they were kind of doing it like commercial brokers do when they rent commercial real estate. Uh, they take a you know that you know the five year lease term and then get a percentage of that, and then at the renewal or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm not too familiar how Newark works or whatever the case, but I think according to the law, just like in New Jersey, if you hire that broker to find you an apartment, they're entitled to a commission, even with the new law that's out there. Where prior, it just said, I brokered this deal, I get paid no matter what happens. Um, so I just don't know exactly how, the, you know, what, exactly what transpired before the new law and what transpired after. But I know from what I've heard is that if you still want to hire a broker in New York, you they still getting paid to the broker fee, you know? And I don't think I'm pretty sure 90% of the people working in New York are going to hire somebody to find them an apartment because they don't got time to do it on their own. They don't have a choice. Yeah, exactly. I don't think even New York has an MLS. Um, you know, they have like a, a bunch of different websites out there, really. They don't have like a, a, a physical MLS in New York, you know? So. Okay. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, Dizzy, if I use the hard money lender to purchase rental property, how long do I have to wait to refinance or is there a better way to purchase the rental property? Um, usually with, uh, there's a, usually a six month seasoning. Uh, so you gotta wait at least six months to cash out, refinance that property. Most banks want to see at least one year. Um, so usually, you know, it varies from case to case scenario. If you, um, what I do is when I do a multifamily house is I renovate instead of like, you know, gutting the entire building and starting from scratch or whatever the case may be, I get one apartment ready as soon as possible. My whole team is one apartment, bathrooms, kitchen, bath, floors, spackle, paint. That way one apartment is ready for rent. 
and I move a tenant into that one apartment while the other apartments are being renovated. So my cost practically to, you know, my hard money cost for that property isn't coming out of my pocket. The tenant's paying for that hard money cost. You know what I mean? So there's different strategies and logistics to minimize your expenses, you know, and, uh, when you're doing a, you know, buying uh, these mine holds. Now, he said, is there another way? Now, if the property is a distressed property and a regular bank's not going to give you a mortgage, you have to use hard money lender or private equity or whatever the case may be. <laughs> then once it's you know, stabilized and it's cash flowing, then you go to your local bank and do a cash out refinance so you get a lower interest rate. So that's the way it's, you know, for the most part, the way it should work. Uh, this, this, uh, this works. Cause he's uh, he says I'm concerned with development like hotels, resorts, theme parks, like big projects. You think it works the same way? What? Uh, what? With the um, the the rental property, like you said, uh, with the hard money, the hard money lender. He said um, no on, on on big projects they ca they do capital stacks. I mean, if you're talking, you know, five, yeah. ten, fifteen, twenty million dollars, they do capital stacks, which means. You have somebody that goes in first position, second position, third position. Uh, you know, normally first position might go 50, 60 percent, depending on the size. Then on big projects like that, one lender doesn't absorb all the risk. They might absorb a majority of the risk, but then they bring in conduit lenders behind that lend at a little higher interest rate. But they basically work the total loan together. You know, I mean, it, it's nothing like a, you know, you know, a smaller type loan. I mean, gee, I heard hotel and things like that yeah I mean, hotel doing, resorts theme parks big projects yeah i mean a resort, a resort might cost 100 million dollars to build i mean depending on the type of yeah. resort i mean that's that's a much more in-depth process private money lenders that are lending on fix and flips and multi-families are not out totally different group of private equities doing you know developments and resorts and things like that because you're talking about a lot more risk a lot more exposure a lot longer projects with a lot more hiccups so there's a different risk appetite different lenders have different appetites so no i mean i that would no no nah, it's totally different ball game that's uh, yeah you're looking you know that's way out of the league you're not doing buys and flips and multifamilies with that kind of you know different ball game out there correct Correct. All right. Cool. I mean, I'm good with the uh, questions. Those are all like a lot of questions on um, on YouTube. We've been on for an hour. Uh, again, uh, Carmelo's links to he teaches real estate investor here in New Jersey. Correct. I'm in New Jersey. Yeah. But we, yeah, our classes are it's a live webinar. Um, so it's I'll be online teaching. I got students all over the country that you know log in. Um, so we teach you basically. Yeah, you know, how to analyze the markets, what's happening in the market, you know, how to read, read a case Schiller index, how to read the, you know, the Warren Buffett indicator, stuff like that to learn to see what's happening in the market. Because <clears> the last <throat> thing you want to do is get burned, you know, especially as a newbie investor, they've never seen a recession before when the real estate market, you know, happened a few years ago. Okay. This is the first time. So you don't want to get stuck out there with your pants down. Um, and then we kind of transition from that into marketing, how to find the deals, how to find the motivated sellers where to find the motivated sellers. And then once you have that deal, you have three options. You can wholesale it, you can buy and flip it, or you can buy, rent it, and re you know, buy, renovate it, and rent it out, and you know, refinance. Uh, so we teach all that in a three-month span. And we, we meet once or, twice a, once or twice a night on a Tuesday, Thursday evening uh, on a live webinar. And that's how I teach the students. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit of uh, economic talk and, um, you know, with the whole Trump and, and everything that's going on right now, uh, where, where do you think see things happening in real estate as far as, you know, our area here in New Jersey? And if you could get into your area, John, or if you know more about what can happen, if, is it going to slow down? Is it going to get better? If Trump stays in office, it's business as usual. It's just that simple. I mean, if he, if, if he stays in, rates are going to stay low. Business is going to stay on. Market's going to stay propped up. If, 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 if he loses, I think things will change dramatically, mm -hmm. you know? And I think for anybody that's liking this economy right now, whether you like Trump or not, you know, what, where the stock market, I mean, have your own opinion about him as an individual, but the people that he put in place that are helping the guy that's keeping the rates down and keeping the stock market propped up for whatever reason, um, you know, if, if he leaves, there's there's a 
the only person that could come in potentially and have the same faith in the market or the market have the same faith in is probably Bloomberg. I mean, Bernie comes in and you're changing the whole dynamic. So um, I think that if Trump stays, it's business as usual. Another four years of this, uh, you know, potentially of this low rate environment, which is good for real estate, which is good for everything. Um, but keep in mind, I mean, and a lot of people don't understand this, is that if the stock market pulls back and we get some kind of a correction as a result of, you know, maybe somebody new coming in because we're very inflated on the market side of things, the stock market side of things. And, you know, let's be honest, real estate prices are really high, too. I mean, relative to averages in a lot of major areas. And even as Carmelo was saying earlier, with it being a seller's market and things are selling very rapidly and, and prices are going up on a daily basis, that stock market moves down and pulls back and you start seeing banks pull back. You start to see them clamp up. It's the way it works because the money flow starts to slow down because the money's all coming from a certain area, right? And as that stock market grows, people make more money. As more money continues to populate the system, it starts to go out in other areas like real estate. You see that pull back. The stock market it has a, it has a vibrating effect on everything else, um, and and like I said before, Trump is very pro business, and the market is very pro Trump to keep it propped up. So I think if he if he goes out again, completely nonpartisan statement, just factual, I think that you you see things change at least on the front of you know business as usual is concerned. Yeah, yeah. I think like every election year in the past, it's always had a little bit of a slowdown because of the uncertainty. Uh, I just think, you know, there's always a catalyst that could be treated up, that causes a recession to happen. Um, and right now, you know, if you, uh, my thing is that I always follow the bond market. You know, uh, we're basically, you know, money is given to the government. Um, the government issues a bond and that's how they get their returns. And right now the rates are so freaking low yeah. that, you know, who wants to give money to the government? So the money is going into different markets, it's going into real estate, it's going into stocks, it's going into different uh, funds and whatnot. So nobody wants, you know, what's the government giving you? 1%, 1.5% right now? So that I money think, is not I going. I think the 10 years, a point, I think it closed at 1.55. 1.55. So, 1. I mean, so who's giving money well, to the government right now? Yeah. Nobody. So it's they're putting money in. Yeah. Exactly. They're putting money into real estate. They're putting in the money into banks or so whatever the case may be. Uh, once you're going to see, you know, if the, that's obviously, if the rates go up, then guess what? The money's going to come out of the mar stock market. It's going to come out of you know the banking. It's going to come out. They're going to be like, okay, let's go buy bonds again at five, six, seven percent. If you're buying a bond at five, six percent, the rate's going to go eight, nine percent in the house. Um, so really, it's what you want to kind of watch is what's happening in the bond market. And if you look overseas, everything's negative equity right now. You know, so oh, they're yeah. basically driving. They're driving the euro. The euro. They're driving the Britex. They're driving all that shit down to like negative to keep the US dollar afloat, but how long can that sustain until the shit hits the fan? You know what I mean? So I don't know. I can't I that's what I watched and that's basically what can happen. That's the next catalyst I think that's gonna cause something to happen. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Um but I don't know. What goes up comes down and what goes down comes up. That's all I know. Yeah, <laughs> a rever- a rever- um, to the mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it always yeah. It, it always it always won't correct. It's just how long can you Either one of them. But look, and the good thing is, to that point, a a pullback right now would not be a terrible thing for either market. For somebody like me that likes to buy the right number, whether it be stocks or or properties, I mean, a a pullback is not a bad thing. It's a natural thing to occur. People talk about it like it's awful because the only pullback that they can commiserate with is when the market tanked in 07, right? Yeah. There's been plenty of 15% corrections, 20% corrections, yeah. right? That present themselves as incredible buying opportunities because people are running for the hills because the media gets them so scared, right? Yeah. But in reality, yeah. they turn into incredible buying opportunities. So I don't think even if the market pulls back, it's a terrible thing, right? I mean, I yeah. think I think it opens up opportunities for people and I think it'll be good. So I think, look, I think either way, if, if business continues as usual, I think people will be happy. I think if you, we do get a pullback and some sort of correction, which I think we're well overdue for, I think it would be a good opportunity anyway, going into next year. So I think, I mean, in my opinion, I think it's a win-win. Okay, yeah. So the correction is, uh, you know, helps, you know, weed out, uh, Weed out all the fake guys that are out there. I mean, it's too much money in the market right now. It's too easy money, so it's like ridiculous. Yeah, you know, but absolutely. And absolutely. and you see you see a lot of newbie investors that don't know what they're doing. Oh yeah, that's all day long, man. It's crazy. So, and, and what are some some examples of them not knowing what they're doing? 
they're overbidding on the properties, number one, so they're buying it at the wrong numbers. Um, I've seen, and I went in personally, you know, contractors took off on them and work, you know, work wasn't done properly. Um, and now they got to start all over again. And, you know, either that or the, the hard money guys are taking the, the, the property back because there's no way they're going to make any money on this deal. They just stopped making mortgage payments. Um, another thing what people don't realize is that, yeah, you know, I got 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars saved. I'm going to go flip a house. Well, you got closing costs. You got to pay the hard money guy. Yeah, you know, every single month, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars isn't going to carry you that long when you're borrowing, you know, at nine, ten, fifteen percent interest rates. Those more of those hard money loans are very expensive. And as soon as the shit hits the fan on something, and you really have no money left, then you're shit out of luck. Uh, so I've seen this happen over and over and over again. It's like unbelievable. And it doesn't yeah. matter if the person comes with fifty thousand or five hundred thousand. It all depends on the type of property that they're going to get if they'll get stuck on on or not. It's all it's all it's all relative though, right? I mean, it's all relative. If you come with five hundred thousand, you're buying a six hundred thousand dollar property. Obviously, you know your leverage is going to be light. You know what I mean? If you if you're trying to if you're bringing fifty grand to the table on a five hundred thousand dollar purchase and you're just covering the down payment and closing costs with your hard money lender, then you're going to be choking yourself out throughout the entire process, right? You're going to be living on fumes. And I think doing doing the arithmetic. There's a lot of variables to get comfortable when you walk into some of these deals that we talked about earlier. You got to identify the property, you got to comp it out, you got to do the renovations, you got to line up a contract, and you got to handle the financial side too. Like uh, Carmel was saying, I mean that that, yeah. that that you know if you're borrowing private money, you know, and you don't have any other options, and you're paying eight, nine, ten percent on a three hundred thousand dollar property, what's ten percent is three grand a month. Yeah, that right. goes six months it takes you to turn it. That's an eighteen thousand dollar line item you've got to add into your budget, right? That you may not account for. And I think you know, people walking into the first deal. That's why I think what Carmel said earlier about, you know, your first deal being his recommendation about somebody's first deal coming in being something like an FHA multifamily, you know, user, you know, owner occupant with tenants is a good idea because you can get you know, even if you make a mistake, you're still living there, right? You know, you're not it's not a mistake that you're potentially dragging yourself into the into the ground um that you can't that you can't get back from, right? If you mess up on a renovation on a rental, well you got two other rentals, right? Plus you're already budgeting the fact that, that, that you're paying your own you're paying your own mortgage payment anyway. So anything above that is gravy. So I just think that I mean, you know that's probably the safest way to do it if people aren't entirely clear with all the variables but again like we we're talking about earlier i think that the i think tv clouds a lot of this stuff for people you know mm, i mean yeah. they see what happens on tv they see the dollar signs they see all the other stuff and i think they think it's so simple and easy and they get into the first one and their head's spinning off their shoulders right i mean it ends up being a real learning experience and if you can somehow mitigate that without the with the least amount of damage i think that's what you should try and do obviously yeah. Yeah, and I just think like you know, people say you see these things, you know, flip houses and no money down. Okay, good luck with that one. Yeah, yeah exactly. You don't got people, yeah, yeah. You don't got forty, fifty thousand dollars of reserves per flip just to be on the safe side. Uh, you shouldn't be in the real estate game. <laughs> but it, but you know what it is? It's not only that, but how many real private money lenders want to lend you one hundred percent anyway, right? Yeah, no, nobody does. Yeah, they, they, they don't want to know that you're going to walk out of it, and they're the only ones going to take a beating, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't doesn't work like that. So even if so even if they were lending you hundred hundred percent, you still got to come up with closing costs. You still got to they're not going to lend you the first draw. You got to start paying contractors from day one. And then they do inspections. You still need twenty or thirty thousand dollars if they gave you one hundred percent financing just to get started on the construction. So you know? is that so, what they look for? Like, let's say you get a property in Jersey City or Newark, you know, what would you look for? What What would they look for? Like a hard money lender? The numbers, really. They just look at the numbers because yeah. they're asset because they're asset based, right? Yeah. Their, their their end game is. I mean, think any lender that lends money doesn't matter what kind of money they're lending. Is they're thinking of their backside, right? So Carmelo comes in and buys a property. He's levered at sixty percent loan to value. That lender says, "Yeah, sure, man. I, you know, it's it's worth a million. You want six hundred thousand? I'll give you six hundred thousand at nine percent. If Carmelo doesn't pay, he takes it back, and he's got four hundred thousand. And you know, he forecloses, takes it back. He's got four hundred thousand dollars in equity in that property. He just made an eighty percent return, right? And if Carmelo does pay. You know, he's paying 9% on $600,000 throughout the life of it, right? Or at least till he pays it back off. So he wins that way. So it's a win-win in those cases, right? Mm. So, I mean, obviously, they'd have to go through the foreclosure process. But in that instance, 
you know, that's not their main goal, but even their worst case scenario is better than their best case scenario, right? Their worst case scenario that makes $400,000 if they foreclose and take it back, assuming a $600,000 mortgage on a million dollar property, their best case scenario, they're charging 9% interest on, you know, 600000 until he pays it off. So, I mean, in those cases, it's it's a hedged bet for them, right? If they got the right people working for them as far as the foreclosure side. And a lot of these lenders, Carmelo, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of them do deed in lieu of foreclosures. So that means yeah. that literally they make you sign it over. They don't even have to go through the foreclosure process. So they, you, you sign that deed over to them. If you stop making payments, they shortcut the foreclosure process. Yeah. So they're, they're typically not, or just to be clear for anybody considering it, private money lenders, hard money lenders know that their leverage in you is things like this. They're not people to typically be toyed with. They're not like regular banks. They have an amount of capital they have to lend. They have to be successful on the lending of that capital in order to get more capital for more investment and more investors. So, you know, they need to keep those numbers. They don't, they don't have a lot of tolerance. Like, you know, if you don't go pay Capital One, you know, one month and you're 30 days late, Capital One will call you, you know, call you, but they're not going to do anything serious. You're late with some of these lenders 30, 60 days and they accelerate that process quick. You know, they're not, it's not necessarily a situation where they want to give you a tremendous amount of flex and leash to be able to, to be able to mess around with them on. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. And I've seen it where, you know, you guys have renovated the property, rented it out and then go to cash out refinance and their credit is so, you know, really bad that they wouldn't even cash out refinance. And then the banks took the property back. You know what I mean? I'm like, what the, how the hell did you fuck this up? And it was, it was crazy. You know, so yeah, yeah you know, at the end of the day, you know, you need a good team in place. You need a, a good hard money company. You need a good contract there. You need everything in place the right way. Otherwise, it'll go sideways real fast, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, as you know, as you know, I mean, it takes a little while to get all those ducks in a row and yeah. it's part of the learning curve, right? Mm-hmm. But if you can, if people can be realistic and stop watching what television glorifies and realize that, you know, real estate investing and buying and selling in real estate is, is a job. It's not an easy job. You know, it's it's a real job that, call, you know, it, it requires a lot of work and it requires a lot of focus. It's not some cakewalk. Yeah, John, uh, you were saying it. before that uh, doing real estate is like having a job. Like it goes into like e- economic talk. Like there's a lot of people doing real estate right now. There's t- yeah, I was saying earlier that, that, that it, it, because it, it's the glorification of it, right? It's it, people watch TV and they see how easy it is. Or how easy they interpret it to be, right? The way TV tries to project it to you. You know, these fix and flip shows with the husband and wives and the and to this guy and to that guy. I mean, I think they got dogs flipping houses now on TV. <laughs> and, and the reality of the situation is that it's just not like that. You know, anything you see on TV, it doesn't tell you all the pitfalls. It doesn't it doesn't focus on those pitfalls. It doesn't even really break down real financial numbers. It doesn't back out agency in most cases and any soft cost that you may incur when you sell it, it doesn't really give an accurate depiction in a lot of cases. And so people walk in all guns blazing. They may have some cash in their 401k and they're like, you know what? I'm done working for corporate America. You know, I, I, let's get to work. Right. Or they may have some stuff available. They got some cash on the side and they just don't want to work for, for corporate America anymore. And they, and they go hit it and, and then they get hit. Right. Cause they come in way too hot. Right. They just come in way too hot because they're, they, they think they have it all figured out. And I think, you know, I think somebody like Carmelo, what he does with people where he kind of, you know, from at least what I understand, you know, where he kind of guides you on how to get in, you know, something like that can probably definitely alleviate the degree of the learning curve that you absorb. Because everybody gets a learning curve. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to get a learning curve. If you can figure out a way to expedite that with the least amount of exposure, I think that obviously that's the name of the game. Yeah. Is that how you do that 1031 exchange? Like people who are retiring and they want to get into real estate. Is that how you different. get those type of customers, um, those type of people, uh, Carmelo? No, 1031 exchange is different. Basically a 1031 exchange is a tax department. So what happens is, for example, you know, I, I have some properties in Newark. I bought them two, three years ago. I, you know, I paid like a you know buck fifty, three hundred thousand. I sold them for double or triple that price. Um, so instead of me taking that money and putting it in my bank account, I'll get hit with capital gains. So what I do is I take that, I give it to a ten thirty one administrator. They hold on to my money. I locate a bigger asset. So now I'm buying like a you know sixty six lot mobile home park um, in Indiana that we're looking at. And now we take that money and we can go from a smaller you know six family or three family building. We're buying a bigger real estate asset. Uh, so basically just a way to grow your portfolio and defer your taxes. 
that's all a 1031 really is. You know? You're doing a lot of those, I saw. Yeah, we've got three right now, and I'm selling some more properties. I have another three or four lined up soon. So, you know, trying to get into like bigger deals, 50, 60, 100 unit apartment buildings instead of, you know, three, six, 12s and stuff like that, you know? So, but even to elaborate on what John said about, you know, experience and whatnot, um, I even, I, you know, I've seen it with experienced real estate flippers. So, for example, you know, somebody flips a house and they're like, oh, great, I made $50,000. That went well. Now they take the, you know, they take the initial investment that they put in plus the $50,000 that they just made on that other house. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to go buy two flips. Now they're like, okay, great. That's, this is going to go fantastic. I'm flipping two houses at once. I see it on Facebook all the time. Oh, I can't believe it. You know, I've been doing this three years. I'm flipping three houses at once. Okay, great. You know, you took all your investment from, you know, your initial flips. Now the market takes a fucking tank. And guess what happens to all that money you just made? You got nothing left. Zero. You worked all those years for zero dollars. You know what I mean? Because when that market tanks, it's either on a Black Friday or on a Black Monday. Nobody tells you it's going to happen. You know what I mean? Doesn't a 31, do you do the 31 exchange being married? Because isn't it more money? that you get if you're like married, whether if you're single, they take if more? it's your primary residence, not an investment property. So if, you, if I sell my primary residence, if I, if I make under $500,000 profit, then I keep, I don't pay any taxes as a married couple. If it's over $500,000 profit, then you pay capital gains on uh, the difference over $500,000. When would you see such a thing? Like, you know, properties being sold that much I mean, these are these are couples that are investors that eventually will make that much in profit. They don't prop, they, they don't just sit in their house for ten years and then sell it and make five hundred thousand. Or this is for someone who's been living in their home for thirty years, let's say in Jersey City, and now the mm -hmm. property is seven hundred thousand dollars and they bought it for two hundred thousand. Is that that'll be the case? Yeah, if they paid two hundred thousand dollars for the house and sold it for seven hundred thousand dollars. They're making a five hundred thousand dollars as a married couple on their tax returns. They don't pay any tax, any capital gains tax on that. Um, but if they were to, you know, bought it for two hundred thousand dollars and they sold it for one point five million dollars, then they got to pay. They got to pay capital gains on eight hundred thousand dollars. So um, they ten thirty one that to to organize that that um that paperwork. How much mm -hmm. does, does that usually run? A thousand dollars, fifteen hundred bucks. Oh, that's not even a lot of money. No, it's not a lot. No, it's just some paperwork. That's all it really is. Nothing crazy. And then you'll do the same thing over and over if you get that capital gain. I mean, if you get that amount of money, you turn yeah. it over to another 1031, 1031. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I, I know we sold the property in Newark. We so we bought it for 320. We sold it for 685. So, we made a gain of over $300,000. We take that and we buy the mobile home park. We're buying it for $600,000. Once we stabilize it and it's a performing asset, it's worth one point eight million dollars. Then we take that we sell it, and now we made you know we made our three hundred thousand dollars just turned into a million dollars. We take the million dollars and we go buy a hundred unit building. You know what I mean? So you just keep growing and growing and growing. That's great. not only that, not only that, but just to take it a step further, just from the tax perspective. So he's avoiding the taxation of three hundred grand. He's plopping it over there at the mobile home park, right? He gets that inflated now to let's just say for argument's sake, once it's stabilized, let's just speak conservatively in round numbers. He gets it up to about a million dollars, right? He can open up a line of credit, let's just say, for which percent against that million. He's got now he has his three hundred back out that he made from the sale before, and you get to write off the interest now on that line. So now he literally not only did he avoid the taxation on the three hundred grand, but he went over, invested in a larger asset with more equity, and he can open up a line. And the money he borrows on that line is all taxed. The interest is tax deductible. So not only did he not pay taxes. But he's going to be able to write the interest from the line that he uses relative to the mobile home park off. So I mean, it's it's a win win, right? You see a lot of people that do uh, these these ten thirty ones. They rolled into a new project and then they open up a line up to sixty percent, get access to sixty percent of the cash to get a tax write off, right? So you not only do you not pay tax, but you get an additional tax write off when you buy the new asset because you open up a line because it's free and clear for most part. You will have equity to some degree, which allows the opportunity if it's a value added situation to be able to get a line of credit, a large one, and then use that as an additional tax write-off. So 1031 is great. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of advantage to them. And in situations like that, where you have a large amount of equity coming out of a project to put into something else, 
I mean, it, you know, especially if you're pumping it into another value added situation, it's the opportunities are endless. Yeah. How long do you have when you get that money to put it into a 1031 exchange? I have uh, 40. I got to put it as soon as the closing takes place. I have 45 days to identify a property and six months to close. I can always file for an extension if need be. So if I need an extra 45 days or 90 days or whatever, there's always extensions there can file if need be. So it has to be set up before you sell the property and you make the money. Yeah, exactly. So you have to know all that before you're going to make that move. So if yeah. the exit strategy is we're going to put this in a 1031 exchange, you already come with that mindset before you make your, me- your next move. Exactly, yep. You heard that, guys? Amazing. Yeah, everybody's saying, oh, my God, such great info. Can you use 1031 under an LLC? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's mostly, most of them are LLCs. Yeah, it's almost all, it, when you're buying real estate, you typically do it in LLCs. I mean, just for the isolation of, of liability. Yeah. So, almost, I'd say probably a large majority of them are, you know, LLCs. Yeah, all LLCs. Yeah. But not, not a sole proprietorship or partnership. It's a corporation under an LLC. Look, in any situation I, that you make money, like we, like Carmelo was talking about, I mean, in situations like that to that degree where it's not a primary residence and there's no caveats there up to a certain amount, you have to pay capital gains on it. Now, it, yeah. it, it, does it make sense to you to avoid that capital gain? I mean, if you're making $15,000 and you have a long-term capital gain of roughly 15%, you're paying $1,600 or $1,700 on that. It may not be a good idea to waste the 1031 on it. If yeah. you're making a million dollars on the sale, some whether it's sole proprietor, it's in your personal name, or more properly done in LLC, it doesn't matter. You can 1031 it regardless. You know, I mean, you're entitled to that through the tax code. So, I mean, it's just what you're entitled to do. It's just, does it make sense to use it in certain situations? There's short-term capital gains, there's long-term capital gains. After you go into property for a certain period of time, your your tax rate goes from short-term to long-term. Your short-term capital gains rate is your ordinary income rate. So if you get taxed 25%, your short-term capital gain is going to be 25%. When you get to a long-term capital gain, it drops down to 15%. So if you've owned a property, I think it's five years for a property. If you've owned it, I believe. A lot uh, long-term gains on real estate, I think it's five think years. Two years now. Two years? Yeah. Okay, so two years. If you've owned a property for two years, your capital gains rate goes from 26% down to 15%. So just, I mean, all these things need to be weighed when you're doing a 1031, which, look, if you're, if you're in, the, you know, in business the way that, you know, Carmelo's doing it and the way that I do it, it makes sense to do the 1031s in a lot of cases because why on earth if you're just going to reinvest it into another piece of property, would you want to pay, even if it's 15% on 300 grand, right? You're paying roughly $50,000 to the government just on that sale. And then you're going to turn around and take the 245 you have left, pump it into another real estate project. So, I mean, I think, and Carmelo, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, 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 uh, the issue that's at hand is, is being able to identify the new asset that you're going into in that period of time, right? Yeah, you can file an extension. But I mean, sometimes when you're under the gun, it's not as easy to find a deal. I mean, you're out hunting for deals in Indiana, right? So yeah, no, yeah, we knew our strategy before we even started selling these properties. What we're gonna do? Um, obviously, we know that you know low income housing is uh, always uh, always a money maker. So we already knew our strategy before. So it was like, you know what? Let's just sell these assets off. And we were, we've been looking for like a year before we started selling our properties. Um, so you know, you always want to be ahead of the game, you know. Absolutely, planning in advance. We had a doubt. Yeah, that's what's up. That's what's up, guys. Uh, a lot of people are happy with the information here on um, uh, YouTube and on Facebook. I mean, we've been on for an hour twenty seven minutes. It flew by that fast. Um, if there's anything you want else to say, John? No, Carmelo. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Appreciate Likewise, you. Likewise, man. No, thank you. I don't know if you want to plug your site or whatever, uh, you know, for yes. anybody that listens to this. Yeah, it's like that. At the end of the day, you know, I've been, you know, I've been doing this for like, you know, 16 years. I was actually a school teacher when I started this business and I kind of continued teaching and now I kind of like teaching real estate. I just seeing, I hate seeing people get burnt in this business. You know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of fucking gurus and bullshit out there that's giving them a lot of misinformation. Um, so you know, I just want to tell people the truth, and this is what it's going to be done, and this is how it's done. And uh, everyone's like, oh, look, you know, I'll take you out to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you know, it's all so much you can eat and picking my brain. So <laughs> I figured I'll just start, you know, a live webinar, and we just—it's a live thing. We teach kids, you know, teach people online on how it's done. 
uh, done the right way, and you know we take it from there. So if anyone's interested, you know visit our website, reiforddummies.com, REI the number four dummies.com. And there's a lot more information on the website there. And if you want, you can set up a phone consultation with me and just speak directly to me and how we can help you uh, get started in the business or grow your business. Great, great. I'm going to yeah. put Carmelo's info below so you guys can have it. Just go to his link, Real Estate for Dummies. Uh, that's uh, R, uh, where is it right here? R E I, the number four, dummies.com. He has. YouTube videos too, which is, um, I, I linked the YouTube videos to his YouTube channel as well, help him grow his channel. Uh, again, real estate is, uh, like they say, it's always going to be here. If you guys want to learn it, here we go. People who are looking for credit repair, as you can see, we are knowledgeable on what to do, how to do it. <laughs> and, uh, if you need more info, definitely hit, hit us up, but no, Carmelo, I really appreciate it. Uh, Carmelo is really active in real estate every day. This is his life. This is what he does. And if you follow him on, 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 Inst on, um, on Facebook, he'll definitely let you know how, how, how it is in, um, in real life terms. Cause everybody thinks it's, it's all, you know, um, flowers yeah. and candy being in real estate and it's not that way. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, John, anything else? No, that's all. Again, come out. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank uh, you, John. Uh, Thank you, busy. Yeah, absolutely. You, no, I'm good. All right, guys. All right, guys. All Thanks, right, my love. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Mi gente, you already heard right there. Back and forth. Talk real estate. I mean, I know some smart people that know what they're doing and they take action for what they're doing. And this is all here to educate you guys on what we do. Okay. So even Carmelo being in real estate, he said his credit never went over a 640, 660. And then he came to us and he started being at seven, over 700 credit scores. Okay, so again, it's a process to position your credit report to be able to do what you want to do. He didn't get into the cars and the many properties, the other properties that he has, but we, he actually was able to finance a Lamborghini as well at the same time uh, that we fixed his credit. So good for him. Uh, again, you can follow him on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube, all the info below. Uh, as you can see, we currently do credit repair and we take on credit repair customers on a daily basis. So if you are looking for a credit repair quote, see how much it's going to be. As you can see, he came from Lexington Law, which is we get a lot of customers from there. And he was with them for some time, but we were still able to help him reach his goals, which right now he's doing great with everything relating to his real estate and his credit. All right, let me see if I got any more questions here on Facebook. Okay. No one else is there. Can get that. Uh, appreciated knowledge is always on point. The Genesis Project, you got it. Breon, great live stream. You got it. You remember, uh, Breon and Manny, you can always come back and see uh, this video. I, the reason why I got this microphone right here. All right, this is a professional microphone is so that the quality could be better because now on video stream, YouTube, Facebook, you guys are not really watching me. A lot of you don't want to watch, but you do want to listen. So sound quality definitely needs to be on point. And I hope you hear me clearly because eventually if the sound quality isn't good, then we have a problem. But I know we had a little bit of minor staticky. I apologize for that. Uh, in the event, we'll work towards having a better podcast um, the next time. Now, we do these podcasts every Wednesday. Uh, two Wednesdays ago, I got sick, couldn't do it. Last Wednesday, I had something to do around this time, so I couldn't do it. But we're, ma we're managing to do these every uh, Wednesday. More credit education, real estate education is if you are in whatever circumstance that you find yourself in pertaining to your credit, we know how to get you out of it and position you to do what you want to do. Whether it's real estate, get a car, get an apartment, anything related to that. So uh, great, Mike. Okay, Manny, thank you. I'm about to, about to lease. All right, cool, cool. 
All right, mi gente. Anyways, uh, where is the set right now? Okay. Hold up. We're going to go right here before we leave. And we put our I Gizzy Credit theme song. Okay. Where is the set? Where is the set? Oh, it's actually below. So, go right here. Okay, okay. Hey, where is my song at? Where is my song at, guys? Anyways, listen. It's been a long day. <laughs> uh, let me put these two right here. Gizzy Credit theme song. Where is my Gizzy Credit theme song? I got I to gotta go out with my Gizzy Credit theme song. I want to thank everyone for just being here. Look at that. They got my Instagram right here. Oh, my people, YouTube, Facebook Live, just finished the podcast, real estate, testimonial for Gizzy Credit Team, make sure y'all check it out, link in my bio for my YouTube channel, you already know. Hey, <laughs> oh. 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 Uh. 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 Don't be scammed. What you need is just to change your plans. Oh. Get that cash. <laughs> What's good, my people? Thank you so much for logging on. Everybody know. Thank you. I'm going to see ya. Take care.